In this video, I will talk about probability theory for random numbers. These can be either real or complex valued. They have a mean and a variance that we will define and compute. And one particularly important example is the Gaussian distribution, both in the real and the complex case. We will extend this theory from scalars to vectors, and then from vectors to processes. Let us start by talking about random variables, and suppose the world around this is random in some way. Then a random variable is a measurement of that randomness. So for something that we would like to measure, there is a sample space called gamma s of all types of random things that could happen, all the random states around us. And when we are measuring something like rolling a die, well then a random variable is what we are measuring. And we have a measurable sample space, which is the outcome that we can get from this way of producing a realization of this random variable. So one realization omega here from the sample space gives us a value of our measurable random variable. And this is then the measurable sample space. We can get any value, any realization in that set. And different realization will have different probability of showing up. And the total probability of getting something, one realization within the measurable sample space is one. So we write the probability of omega, or uppercase omega here, which is the measurable sample space that is equal to one. If we are interested in what is the probability that we are getting a certain event, which means that the, our realization is in a particular subpart of this measurable sample space. Well, if we call this event A, then the probability of A is something between zero and one. And that tells us that if we are taking many independent realizations of our random variable, then this is the fraction of them that will end up inside of this set representing event A. And there are other event B, for example, we can define different events here and assign different probability to each one of them. To give you a sense of why we are interested in random variables and communications, let's look at thermal noise. This is something that is caused by electrons moving around in the receiver. And the sample space here would have a realization omega that is describing the location of all the electrons and their movements and everything about the physical world. But what we can measure uh, is only what happens to the voltage over, for example, a resistor in our receiver. And that is then our random variable. Another example of randomness is the wireless channel. So when a signal is propagating from a transmitter to a receiver, and there's a lot of objects around, then if we know all of the location of the objects and all of their properties, then we can potentially just ray trace and compute exactly how the waves are moving from transmit to receiver. But this is extremely complicated to do, and we typically don't know the location of all the objects and they're moving around in sort of random ways. In this case, omega in the sample space could be the location and properties of all the objects around us. While what we are measuring is just the impact that they have jointly on our transmitted signal. So the random variable here might be the measured impulse response of the entire system. Let's move on and define some properties of real valued random variables. The cumulative distribution function, or CDF, is denoted like this with an uppercase F, and it's the probability that our random variable takes a realization that is smaller than a particular number. So that's why we can only do this precise thing for real valued numbers, where so we have one dimension. And this is then the event that X is smaller than this value, and it has a number between zero and one. And as we are increasing this number, the event is sort of growing in size. And for that reason, uh, we get something that is larger and larger. Here's an example called the uniform distribution, where we get values between A and B with equal probability and nothing outside of that. For that reason, if we put the value of X that is smaller than A, we get zero. If it's larger than B, we get one. And in between, we get something that is increasing like this. So the CDF is always non-decreasing and always non-zero. And it is increasing like this in a particular range of numbers. If we take the first derivative of the cumulative distribution function, we get what is known as the probability density function. This function is describing how the probability density or probability mass is distributed over different numbers. In this example here, it would look like this. We have an equal number between A and B, and we have zero elsewhere, and we have these jumps in between 
The probability density function, or PDF, is always non-zero as well, and it also has a property that if we integrate from minus infinity to infinity, all the probability mass is always equal to 1, because that's a total probability. And that means also that we have a to b here, well then the height here must be 1 divided by b minus a. If we would like to know the probability of getting a realization between x1 and x2 like this, then we integrate the PDF between those two numbers, and that way we are summing up the probability mass in this interval. A random distribution is fully characterized by the PDF, but often we are interested in getting more a sense of its properties by looking at just single numbers. And one common number is the mean value, also known as expectation. The mean value is representing what we would get if we take a lot of realizations, we add them up, we divide with the number of realizations, well then on the average we should get this particular number. And mathematically, we take the PDF, we multiply it with the variables realization, and we integrate from minus infinity to infinity to get this particular number. For example, if we had this uniform distribution from before, well then we should take uh, and put in the value here, 1 divided by b minus a, and we should have an integral from minus infinity to infinity, but we only have this value between a and b. So we integrate between a and b. We multiply with x here. If we compute this integral, we get this expression, which can then be simplified to a plus b divided by 2. So it's rather natural that the mean value here is at the center of this interval where we have our uniform distribution. Another thing we can compute is the quadratic mean, or power, of this random variable. That is to take the expected value of the square of it, and mathematically we take the PDF, we multiply it with x squared, and we integrate from minus infinity to infinity. We can similarly just take for the uniform distribution, it's PDF, we take x squared here, we compute this integral, we get an expression looking like this. Finally, something that is called the variance is often very important. And this is describing how large are the variations around the mean value. So if we take the random variable, subtract this mean value, then in order to measure the variations, we take the absolute value square of it. So this is what we're getting here. And we can simplify this by expanding uh, the expression and see that we can compute the variance by taking the expected value of x squared, so the quadratic mean, minus the mean squared. And this is normally what we do when we compute the variance. We are taking the quadratic mean, like this, we take the mean, square it, and then we compute the difference between them and get the particular value. One example of a random distribution is the Gaussian distribution, also known as the normal distribution. And this one is commonly appearing when we have many sources of randomness that are working together, such as having many electrons moving around to produce thermal noise. And then we get the Gaussian distribution, and suppose it has zero mean, well then we write like this, x is Gaussian distributed with zero mean and variance sigma square, and it has this PDF here. It contains e to the power of minus x square divided by twice the variance, and then we have a scaling factor in front. And here by assumption the mean value is zero, the variance is sigma square. And since the mean value is zero, well actually the quadratic mean is equal to the variance. The probability density function looks like this, it's symmetric around its mean value, and it has this bell shape that is also commonly used as a description of the Gaussian distribution. This was for the real valued case. What if we are moving on to complex variables instead? Well, in this case we can still define the probability density function, but now x here is a complex number. And if we would like to say what is the probability of a certain event, A here, which is a subset of the complex space, then its probability, denoted like this, is computed by taking the PDF and integrating over the complex space, over this particular event, A. And if we are integrating over the entire complex space, well then we should get 1, because we are summing up all the probabilities. Apart from the fact that we need to integrate over the complex space, most things follow in the same way. So, for example, the mean value can be computed by taking the PDF, multiply it with x, and then integrate over the complex space. The quadratic mean, well now we need to be careful that we have the magnitude here of x when we are squaring it, and that we have the same thing in this expression. And computing the variance is still the quadratic mean minus the mean value squared, but once again we should be careful with having the magnitudes everywhere when we are taking squares.
Let me also mention that if we are scaling something, say we take x that is distributed like this, we multiply it with the scaling factor c, which is a complex number, but it's a constant, we get a new random variable that we call y. Well then we can compute the mean value of y by using that the definition that we have here is something that's linear, so we can just take c, put it in front, so the mean value of y is c times the mean value of x. And the variance have similar properties, we have integrals here, we can take c out, we will have an absolute value square of c here, and then we get the variance of x. So the variance of y is equal to the variance of x, multiply with the absolute value square of c. The Gaussian distribution can be extended to the complex case by simply taking two independent random variables that are real valued and Gaussian distributed, have zero mean, and they have a variance of sigma square now divided by two then together they have a variance of sigma square. We create a complex number by taking xr plus j times xi, and we call this a circular symmetric complex Gaussian distributed random variable. We write it like this, x is distributed as cn, complex normal or complex Gaussian, it has zero mean and it has a variance of sigma square which is the sum of the two variances. And to compute its PDF, we can take the PDF of the real part, the PDF of the imaginary part, we multiply them together, and this is the expression that we are getting now with the absolute value square of x. It has the properties that the mean value is zero, as we have, because the real and imaginary part have mean values that are zero, and the variance is the sum of the two variances, so it's sigma square. If we plot the PDF, with the real part and the imaginary part, we see that we have this bell shape again, but now it is in two dimension because we have the real and the imaginary part. And since they're independent, this is something that we can rotate and it will look the same in all directions. And this is also what this circular symmetry means, that if we take x, we multiply it with some complex face that will rotate it in the complex space, then we get the same thing back. And we can see that because the PDF only depends on the magnitude of x and not on its particular face. So that's why we have this rotational symmetry. Most people who say complex Gaussian, they mean circular symmetric complex Gaussian. One can define other types of complex Gaussian random variables as well, with some kind of correlation between the real and the imaginary part or different variances, for example, but that won't be considered here. So we will just call this the complex Gaussian distribution. A multivariate distribution is a random vector. So say that we have m random variables, x1 to xm, we put them in the vector, well then we have a multivariate distribution or we have a random vector. Its mean value can be computed by taking the vector containing the mean values. When it comes to the variance, well now we have m entries and all of them can both have a variance and a correlation between each other. So for that reason, we need to define something called a covariance matrix. This is an m by m matrix describing the relationship between the different elements. Mathematically, we write like this, cov x, and this is the expected value of x minus its mean value times x minus its mean value, but with the Hermitian transpose. So this is an outer product. In this m by m matrix, the variances will appear along the diagonal. For example, on diagonal element m, we have the variance of xm. And if we look at an arbitrary element m, n, so m throw, nth column, then we get xm minus its mean value times xn minus its mean value with the complex conjugate, and we compute the expected value of that. This is also known as the covariance between xm and xn, therefore we call this whole thing the covariance matrix. A typical example of a random vector is the complex Gaussian vectors. So suppose we have x1 to xn, all of them are complex Gaussian, have zero mean and a variance sigma square. Then if we put them in a vector, we write this as being a complex Gaussian vector with zero mean and it has a covariance matrix here which is sigma square because we have that as variance and they're independent so therefore all the off diagonal elements are zero. So that's why we have an identity matrix over here. We have the mean value here and we have a covariance matrix over here. And by looking at the dimension here, this is an m by m matrix, we can deduce that this is an m dimensional vector. This random distribution is independent and identically distributed because all the elements are independent and have the same distribution. We can also create a correlated random variable that is still complex Gaussian. 
So say that we take x here, we multiply with some matrix A, then we get a new vector y. If we would like to compute this mean value, it's A times the mean value of x, and since the mean value is 0, we still have 0. If we compute the covariance matrix of y, then we will get A times the covariance matrix of x times A Hermitian. And since the covariance matrix of x was this scale identity, we get A times A Hermitian transpose, and then we have this sigma square. So we can write this Gaussian distribution like this with a new covariance matrix moved in here. Finally, we will talk about random processes. So this is a random continuous time function. So it's an extension of what we had before, which was a scalar, then a vector, and now we have something that's an entire continuous time function. So we have a sample space, and every time we are taking a random realization, we get not just one number or a vector with numbers, we get an entire function here. So this is one example over time, and this is another example, we get another function. The different realizations will of course share some statistical properties because they are all generated from the same sample space. We are interested in random processes because they are naturally appearing and then we take samples of them to get random vectors. So if we have this sequence here of random sampling times, then we take the corresponding sample values, put them in a vector, well then we have a random vector. The mean value might depend on at what time you're taking your sample, and the covariance where you're comparing your sample at two different times might depend on those time values as well. And often we're also interested in what we call the correlation. This is what we're getting when we are not subtracting the mean values. However, wide stand stationary random processes are often of interest when we are modeling things in communication systems. In this case, the mean value is constant, so it doesn't depend on at what time we are taking the sample. Moreover, the correlation between what we are getting at sample at time t1 and the sample at time t2, defined like this, depends only on the time difference. So it doesn't really matter when we are saying that time zero is. We can just shift things back and forth and we'll always keep the same properties. This is what is known as wide stand stationarity. And as you might suspect, random processes are particularly useful to describe thermal noise. These ones are both wide and stationary and have additional properties. In particular, X has a Gaussian distribution at every time where we take a sample, and the white Gaussian processes have a correlation that is zero whenever we have T1 and T2 that are different, and otherwise they are perfectly correlated. So that is described by this direct delta function. In this video, I have described how to model and analyze random scalars, vectors, and even random functions. And these are very useful tools when analyzing communication systems. So data signals are often modeled as describing information that is random. And if you have a complicated propagation environment, then we can describe it as a random variable. And also the thermal noise that is messing with our communication is samples taken from random processes.